Here's Paul Stanley to tell you why he doesn't want to shake your hand. Some people might have a little rock and roll pneumonia. Ugh, not even cold gin will kill those germs. This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to another episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, joining me on the phone from a crowbar down in all kinds of other wonderful places. It is Kirk Weinstein or Winstein, depending on how you want to say it. But we, we've got Don Jameson on the line who who's going to help me with the pronunciation. How, how do we how do we say his name? Well, it, it, the correct pronunciation is Winstein, but. You know, if you really want to dress him properly, you call him the Riff Lord or the Beard of Doom. Those those are just as acceptable as Winstein, Winstein. See, I think it's like a tomato, tomato kind of thing. It must be the American and Canadian pronunciations, but anyway. He's got a new album out called A Dream in Motion. If you haven't heard it, what are you waiting for? It is great. But Don, Don has also got an album out. It is a Denim and Laughter. So you put them all together. <laughs> And you've got a great episode. See? See how that works? I love the way that works out, especially when I get a plug. Yes. So so let us quickly talk about Denim and Laughter. We'll talk about the Monster of Rock Cruise that you were on and I wasn't because mostly I fear boats, quite frankly, let's be honest. And, wow. Uh, well, well, you know, I like land. Land is very, very – land has been very good to me over the years. <laughs> well, I, Mitch, I fell off a skateboard about 10 years ago. And, um, you know, that's only two or three inches off the ground. And um, I've stayed off them ever since. So uh, I'm a friend of the ground as well. But, uh, you know, I get my sea legs every once in a while. Yeah, so see, so, so Denim and Laughter. So it's both albums out recently. I was actually out in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire at the beginning of the month to see the David Lee Roth Kiss Tour start. And I went to a place called uh, Newberry Comics. And in the store, as soon as you walked in, there was a huge display a rack display of Kirk's albums, which I was like, whoa, you don't see that anymore. Holy mackerel. Um, yeah, no, Kirk's got a great rack. Yeah, he really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's a double D, I believe. Um, oh, yeah, easily. <laughs> easily. But, all right, talk to me a little bit about Denim and Laughter. Of course, it is a comedy album, or at least that's what we're hoping. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. We, we never know, but, but, but talk to me about that. It came out uh, just uh, on Friday, February 21st. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what fans can expect and what, what are you trying to deliver? And is, is it a best of, is it new material? Uh, just what do we got? Yeah. So it, we have, um, it's a live standup performance from Los Angeles, as uh, David Coverdale likes to say. And um, I recorded it in a speakeasy, literally an illegal club in Los Angeles, because like rock and roll, uh, I think comedy should uh, have an element of danger to it as well. And I thought, uh, you know, what better place than uh, an illegal club to do the album and, uh, you know, possibly be, you know, raided by the police uh, in the middle of the performance. So I, I thought that might add an extra edge to the proceedings. And uh, it was a really fun time. I did it in front of 40 people, man. You know, I don't I don't need, uh, you know, a packed house. You know, we just uh, did it in front of 40 Don Jameson friendly kind of people. And we had a lot of fun and we made this record. And of course, it's the, the, the packaging uh, courtesy of the great Saxon uh, denim and leather. So, um, you know, it kind of Cop their artwork and, and concept and all that, and uh, slapped it all together. Got Andy Sneap to do an intro and outro for me, and uh, in the middle is 45 minutes of uh, jokes uh, for everything from politics to metal to relationships to gorillas having sex. We gotta love that. So, all right, so talk to me just about the the moment that an album like this comes out, because on one sense, as a comedian, when you put out an album, it's an accomplishment. It's like, all right, we 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 cleaned up this material we've got it done bravo but at the same time it's like fuck now i can't use this material again i gotta come up with another hour so so talk to me about sort of the joy of getting it out but also the realization that now you got to go back in and write another 45 minute set i i think you <laughs> summed it up pretty well it's the uh yeah, it's the uphill climb now, Mitch. Um, yeah, the joy is, you know, putting something together. For me, I love, you know, I'm old school, so um, the, some of the joy I get 
besides obviously perform the material is the you know revolving the packaging um around one of my favorite bands you know pretty much all my albums i've done that with judas priest and lizzie uh zeppelin have all been common themes of my album um i love coming up with the track titles because in this day and age of people cherry picking um you know songs or tracks um because people a lot of people don't buy full uh, records anymore. I try to make even the, the the track names as entertaining as possible, so that if someone's kind of you know going down the list, they might see something and go, "Oh, okay, you know, Gorilla Sex, Spitting, Banana Tits." I'm downloading that one immediately. You know, that's the first one that I'm I'm, I'm doing. So um, that's fun. Um, and you know, we went to number six so far on the iTunes charts, so it's it's nice that people are supporting. So that's all the good stuff. But yeah, this is now the uphill climb with, you know, I have, you know, piles of notes sitting on my desk, and now it's about turning uh, those into some kind of magic. Well, the, the, the joy of trying to turn that stuff into magic, but, uh, and I've also noticed that fans can have a, a, a full listen if you go to the Metal Blade YouTube site. They have uploaded the entire album, so you can go check it out and get the streams from that. But uh, also, speaking of streams, you were on a boat recently, the Monsters of Rock Cruise, and you got to see local Canadian legends Honeymoon Suite, but the band that I go on and on and on and on about, Thunder. Your first Thunder experience. How, how was that for somebody who didn't know and just sort of got tired of me talking about it? Well, I didn't get tired of you talking about it. I just uh, automatically assumed they were a Canadian band because um, they weren't, you know, they weren't very big here in the States for whatever reason. Uh, and then you educated me, which I love, you know, and when we have these conversations, much like when I used to do that metal show, like we all learn from each other. And I learned that Thunder was a, a British band and that uh, this singer, you told me when I saw you in Montreal, he said this to, guy to me is the the best singer in the business and I was you know uh, well, I had to check it out I'm like how could I not know the best singer in the business per Mitch LaFon and I gotta say um I did a little homework before I went on the boat um I I went down a, a little bit of a YouTube rabbit hole and one of the things I saw him do that really blew me away was um Somebody to Love by Queen and um wow I mean that was that put goosebumps on my arm, man. That was, you know, pretty intense. Um, and they did not disappoint in person. Uh, they were f fantastic. I mean, just spot on. Uh, the vocal, he's a great front man. Did, you know, worked the crowd like a, a champ. And the people loved him. I mean, they had a really good crowd. You know, they played the middle of the afternoon in, in the theater when I saw them. And, uh, man, they were crushing it. So thank you very much. Merci. Yeah, I mean, it, anyway, just just such a great band, and, and and it's just one of those bands. You look at you know Judas Priest and Firepower, and you go, wow, how did they get better with age? And, and Thunder is just one of those where you listen to the early albums, and you go, wow, those were great, and then you hear the last few albums like Wonder Days, and so and you go, oh, oh, they've gotten better. And his voice, you know, we we keep talking about this guy who can't sing and that guy singing to tapes and blah blah blah. But Danny, Danny Bowes of Thunder, just seems to get better with age, which is rare, you know, <laughs> very rare, you know. So what's the what's the Thunder album that you would recommend as the starter kit for for people out there? Well, listen, the the very first one is Backstreet Symphony, and that's the one that had a modicum of success in the states, and they did tour the states and Canada for that one. But I have to say, their latter day one, uh, Wonder Days. Uh, which came out, I guess, 2012, 2013. Uh, it was the reunion album because they had, they, guess what? They've done two farewell tours. They said goodbye in 99, <laughs> and, then, and then they said goodbye in 2009, and then they went, ah, fuck it, we're back. Uh, so, so they've had two uh, failed farewell tours, and they've been on two reunion tours, but the 2012, I guess, I, think, I guess it was 2000, Wonder Days, that album is just, that, that's the one that sold me. That's the one where I went, oh, Wow, this is really good. You know, when you're good, well, I was just yeah, gonna go say ahead, I was just gonna say when you're comparing them in the er, the late eighties and early nineties and you've got Motley Crue firing on full cylinders and you've got Def Leppard firing on full cylinders and you've got Bon Jovi still being Bon Jovi with Richie and the whole thing, 
it was hard to find a moment where you could breathe enough to go, oh, I'm going to check out Backstreet Symphony. But now, with there's a lot of space out there for new music, and you hear the thunder stuff, and you go, ah, look at that. Th- this is still the stuff that I like, and it's being delivered fresh and new. Anyway, so there you go. That's that's my thunder rant, and, and I've got plenty of thunder rants in me, so, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and, and and playlists, I'm sure. Yes, uh, well, I can tell you, my uh, my playlist for Thunder is currently at uh, 551 songs. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest! Right. Oh my God, you're so I love it. You're so committed to the to the music you, that you love, and you know that's the thing. We're, we do. We love this music. We're yeah. so passionate about it, and you know, I, I hear people, you know, they're complaining about. Vinyl, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I don't want to turn the record over every three seconds, and uh, you got to clean it, and then you go, you know, it's the one thing that gives you the most joy in the world. Wouldn't you take the little extra time to to care for care for it, to keep it clean, to keep your needle fresh? You know what I mean? To get up a couple times, what an inconvenience for the nice warm sound of thunder or whoever else on vinyl. That's what life's all about. That is exactly what what life is all about, and you know, listen, I, I'm I'm sold on my playlists. I really put them together like a puzzle and try to make all these different songs from different eras blend into sort of one long song. I mean, you know, listen, I'm I'm looking at my playlist now. Huey Lewis is 234 songs, Buck Cherry's 200, Bon Jovi's 480. I got I got I got I got time on my hand. I got way too much time on my hand. Uh just quickly, uh, speaking of uh, my dream playlist, uh, Dream in Motion by Kirk. He, as far as I know, has your face tattooed right over his heart or something like that. Um, I, I wish it was my face, it's, but it's actually uh, the That Metal Show logo. Oh, uh, you see? Well, he still tattooed. has room for your, I'm sure he has room for your face somewhere. Well, on his yeah, on his other uh, chesticle, he could he there's room for my face, but um, he he uh, he kept a no, I wouldn't say it was a promise, but he kind of I met Kirk in 2009 at the Download Festival in England, and he came up and introduced himself, and like I didn't already know who he was because I, I love Crowbar. And uh, he goes, man, y'all show is so good, man. I would get your logo tattooed on me if I could. And I said, hey, if you ever do that, don't do it, you know, without uh, letting me know, because we would come and film it. And uh, sure enough, we did that, and we lined him up with this guy, Paul Booth, in New York City. Paul has done everybody in hard rock and metal. He's got like a five-year waiting, uh, you know, waiting list to to get tattooed by him. But he made an exception, and, and Kirk went in and. He went under the uh, went under the gun, so to speak, and uh, he got uh, that metal show tattooed with a giant gargoyle around it. And if you ask him to show it, he, he's always proud to do it. And uh, and then just to stick it to Eddie Trunk because we tried to trick Eddie into getting a UFO tattoo because UFOs his thunder, right? And talks about them all the time. But Eddie wussed out. So then Kirk, after four hours of getting this giant gargoyle logo thing on his chest, got UF, a UFO tattoo on his leg. Oh, so, he's, so so what you're telling me is that Kirk has room for a Thunder tattoo and a Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon tattoo. So I'll, I'll, have to, <laughs> I'll have to talk to him about that then. But anyway, uh, shall, we, shall we listen to Kirk? The, uh, the album Dream in Motion is out now. Folks, do, uh, do go check it out. If you can, buy it. If not, at least stream it. Uh, he put his heart and soul in it. See, I'm going right back to Huey Lewis. There you go. Um, shall we? On est prêt? Are we ready? Let's go. Here Crank is it up. here is the one, the only Kirk. We are speaking with the guitarist Kirk Weinstein. The new uh, solo album, Dream in Motion, comes out January 24th, of 2020. I've had a chance to hear it. It abs- it's absolutely delightful. It's a, it's it's very very powerful, if I can put it that way. The, some of the songs are a little more laid back, but there's an incredible power. Uh, but as we say in Montreal, bonjour, Kirk, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, great to talk to you, Mitch. Yeah, so you and I have uh, followed each other on social media, so it's actually nice to finally sort of get to do an interview. Uh, we have met in the past, but like 2002, you know, beh- backstage at some right, place. Right, it's been, but, been uh, a while. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a while, but those down shows... Uh, 
it was on Ozfest. They they were spectacular. But uh, let's uh, let's talk Dream in Motion. So here you have this first solo album. Talk to me about that. You know, you you've got Crowbar, you've got Down, you've got Kingdom of Sore, you've got all these other outlets and projects, but you've never done one for yourself. Why did you sort of get to in 2019, 2020 say, "Hey, what about me?" Actually, I um, mean, you know, good question, of course, but it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. Mainly, you know, really, I, I first started thinking about it like quite a while ago, like uh, probably in the mid to late '90s, just because I listen to so many styles of music and I'm a fan of, of so many different bands of, of you know every genre. So, um, you know, just actually, I uh, started the idea and the whole thing got rolling and. Uh, like the early summer of 2017, um, and I started writing and recording. I actually did like one one tune at a time. I might do a song or two and take off two months while I went off on tour with Crowbar, come back, do a song, take off a month. You know, you, you get the idea. But um, it was it was really a nice, relaxing, uh, great, you know, like atmosphere and great just vibe to do the record because... There was no deadline, you know, no no pressure from the record label or anything, and no, uh, no, it was it was just laid back. I mean, uh, myself and Dwayne Semino that engineered and produced it, um, we were the only two people in the studio the whole time. So you know, I'd show up in the afternoon with a water and a diet coke, and he'd have his coffee, and we'd the next thing you know, two three hours later, we got a song done, and I'm like, all right, man, I'll you know I'll hit you up in a month or so. So. Um, you know, it worked. It worked out great. It really did. Was the process where you wrote these songs for this project over the years, or are these songs that you've been trying to fit into Crowbar? You've been trying to fit into Down, and just they they just weren't working. And you just said, "Okay, they're great songs, but I got to save them for the right project." You know what I mean? So, where do these songs come from? Are they leftovers, or or or, or are they freshly written? Actually, they're freshly written. None, none of them at all were written uh, for Crowbar or Down. It was when, when the whole idea of doing the solo record came about. Um, I just wrote them one, one at a time. Like, I would get with Dwayne and say, hey, you know, are you available? And, uh, you, know, you know, in the next few days, he'd say, yeah. And I'd, I'd say, okay, I better pick up the guitar and do something. So, um, you know, it, it, it ended up where really every one of them was written specifically for a solo album, uh, and, you know, kind of on the spot, you know, a day or two before going into the studio to, to actually begin recording it. So let me ask you this, because you, you mentioned before you wanted to make a bit of a different album. The The press release states that you jokingly wanted to make an acoustic album and thought, oh, that's a little too cliche. I want to try something different. How important was it for you to do something outside of what you're known for, something that had a bit of a different edge to it, and not just sort of repeat, you know, a different version of Crowbar or a different version of the other bands. Um, it was actually very important to me just as a as a songwriter and, you know, uh just to show another side, like, you know, in a lot of interviews I uh, I've, I've I've used the, the term which or the phrase which I think really fits it. It's just that this record is another side of my writing personality because I have such a diverse, you know, interest in, in, in all styles of music. Um, you know, that, 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 that's one of the reasons why I've been in, in side projects like down, which at one time was a full-time project, but down in kingdom of sorrow. And now, you know, with the solo record, it, it lets me stretch out and do things that I'm not able to do with, with crowbar. And that's important to me. I mean, of course, crowbar is my, you know, my, my number one priority and always will be. Uh, but, it was really important for me to, to just just do something different. You know, I mean, I've been doing Crowball for 30 plus years now. So um, doing doing something different and, and, you know, more melodic, more laid back, more, it's a lot, a lot more spacey and, uh, you know, atmospheric type, maybe if you want to call it that, a lot more, you know, delay on the vocals and a lot of clean guitar. And, and, and I just I love the vibe of it. The vibe is dark. Um, the vibe is heavy, even though it's not sonically heavy. But it, it was very important for me to, to 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 branch out a bit and do do another another style of music that I enjoy writing. 
Yeah, and it turned out great. And I, and I love the version of, of Jethro Tull. So talk to me about some of the differences. Oh, in the, I think that's great. And, and I, I also appreciate the fact that Jethro Tull gets this rap because, you know, they beat out Metallica for the heavy metal thing. And here, right, right. Right, and here's this sort of known heavy metal guy covering a Jethro Tull song. I, I think that was perfect. I don't know if that was intended, but I think it's perfect. But talk to me. It, it, it wasn't, yeah, but, but, you know, you know, at the same time, it's not Jethro Tull's fault they, they won the Grammy. I mean, at the time, I was like, oh, my God, you know, but anyway, uh, you know, I do agree with you on that. It is kind of funny, you know. It is kind of funny, but talk to me about about your different musical influences because you know as i said in in the in the preamble you do we do follow each other on on instagram and on you know the facebook and stuff and i post a lot of different on this day stuff with these different bands whether it's Duran Duran or Brian Adams or Ace Frehley or Kiss and i get a i get a real kick when you comment on stuff because it doesn't matter what the genre is whether it's an in excess You'll always have like a positive comment for the most part, and you seem to appreciate more music than just, you know, Metallica and Megadeth and stuff. Talk to me about a little bit about your musical roots and your musical influences, and and those different genres that that uh, that speak to you. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, my whole uh, rock and roll world began with Kiss Alive One, um, so you know, that that got the ball rolling. But the the thing is, uh, like most people don't realize, and, and this is not just in the last few years, it's been quite a few years now, I'd say maybe even, you know, 20 years or so, um, when I'm at home or I'm at a, you know, out at a pub or whatever, having some beers, um, I I really normally don't play heavy music. It's like my life, of course, being in pro bar is heavy music, but when we're on tour, that's all, that's all that we hear, you know? Whether we're headlining or supporting or whatever it is, they're playing heavy music between the bands. I'm hearing, you know, other heavy bands live every evening. Um, so, you know, when, when I'm out with my wife, just, just chilling and relaxing, or if I'm riding, running errands in the car, you know, and I listen to music, I actually listen to a an 80s pop station uh, that plays a whole lot of what was actually the, the early MTV stuff, like the... You know, split ends and uh, Human League, uh, Duran Duran, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Cindy Lauper, uh, just just a lot of just good pop songs. Um, you know, they throw in a lot of Billy Joel, Elton John, some of uh, the, you know, that type of stuff. But you know, my brain gets where uh, like I like just leaving the studio after being after doing crowbar stuff for you know four hours straight. The last thing I want to hear is something heavy. You know, so um, I listen to. You know everything, and I mean on a regular basis. You know bands like Seals and Crofts and uh, England band and John Ford Coley, America, Poco, uh, Bread. I mean a lot of mellow stuff. Um, and uh, you know I just, uh, of course, you know if I if I do want to put on some something heavy, I listen to classic metal, or you know if I'm going old school, I go back to early Kiss and and, and Zeppelin and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just funny because I, I was going to mention Duran Duran. I didn't know if you, but but you you do like some of the stuff when I post about Duran Duran. Um, talk to me about listening to some of that in in terms of as a songwriter. You know, pop songs are are written with a very sort of specific formula. Talk to me about your songwriting and how do you sort of try to take those influences that you have and that pop stuff that you have and the metal stuff and make it into your own. How, how do you sort of see yourself when you approach a song? What's, what's your formula, if I can put it that way? Um, I mean, as far as, you know, as, as I don't, even with the solo record, I never try to write anything on that's intentionally melodic or intentionally, you know, heavy or it's got to be fast or slow or do me or whatever. I just pick up the guitar and, you know, once I come up, my, like my my approach to writing is once I have one, what I consider, I call it the money riff, but one riff that I think is is a really solid, really, really good riff, then the, writing the rest of the song becomes fun. It's not, it's not uh, stressful. It's not, you know, uh, it, it doesn't uh, give me anxiety. It's like the song writes itself. If you take your time and just build it off of that first initial riff, you know, um, and that's always been my approach. Maybe not in the very beginning of, of my songwriting, you know, uh, uh, attempts at songwriting in the early days, but, you know, for the 
pretty much my entire career with Crowbar, any input I had with Down, any input I had with Kingdom of Sour, and of course on on the solo record, it's just been, okay, I have one killer riff here. So, you know, a lot of times I would arrive at the studio with on the solo record. Um, I, I would, you know, arrive at the studio on the solo record with just one riff, and then within 30 minutes or something, the rest of the song was done. You know, so um, it's, it's always been where I start with one riff, and if that riff I, I really feel is strong and, and, and really hooky and good and, and, and good enough to write, um, you know, write a song around it, and the song kind of writes itself. Yeah, you see, that's great. Now, uh, just real quick, the and I'm sure you've been asked this before, but of course, uh, NOLA was the debut album by Down, came out in 95. We're at 25 years. What does that album mean to you as an artist in terms of, you know, brand and moving forward with, with what you do, but also on a personal level, knowing that you created this music that has lasted and endured for 25 years and people go back to it and go, that's a fucking great album. Um, what does NOLA mean to you? And how do we celebrate 25 years? Um, to me, it's just, it was <clears throat> like, it, it's a, it's a classic record to most people because it came out at a time, I guess when it, when, when it was something refreshing, you know, um, uh, you know, different than what was going on. You know, you had a lot going on in 1995 musically. That was different. You had a lot of extreme you know, bands and, and metal bands, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Pantera was basically the biggest, you know, biggest metal band at the time outside of, of, of Metallica, um, at that, that point in time, at least. And, uh, you know, I just, it was a record that, that, that wrote itself because it was, you know, five guys who grew up together, who were great friends who really didn't take it too seriously. We didn't overthink it. We did. It wasn't our, everyone had their own thing going on with their own bands. So it was more or less, hey, let's get get in a room together, you know, grab our guitars, have a couple of beers, and let's let's just let's just jam and see what happens. And uh, the songs, you know, wrote wrote you know wrote were written so so quickly because it just it just happened, it just gelled. But I mean, to be a part of it is a is a great feeling. Um, I mean, so many people love the record, you know, as I said, and and I myself, I'm, it's nice to be a fan of a record that you. Uh, part of and I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Nola record um, and I always will be I think I think it's a, a great album um, and I think it stood the test of time for the last you know quarter century and uh, I think it will you know for, for many 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 years to come yeah it just really it, it really did stand the test of time uh, let me talk to you about the formation of Crowbar and you look at what was going on musically back in that time yes you know Metallica was at the top of the charts but Crowbar, I, I could think, I can fairly say, wasn't a radio-friendly band. If that's I mean, very I don't know. true. Um, talk to me about some of the challenges you faced bringing that kind of more aggressive music to the forefront. Because I mean, listen, you're here thirty years later. Obviously, uh, the the recipe worked. But talk to me about some of those early challenges. And, and you know, you you play a song and it goes on the radio, and the radio, record company gives you money, and you go on tour, and everybody's happy. But for Crowbar, it must have been different. What was the path, and were there times yeah. where... Yeah, okay, please. No, no, um, um, it was very different, but that was kind of the idea of Crowbar anyway. It was like, you know, we're going to do something completely different than what's... Even even in extreme music, I don't think we're extreme, but, you know, even in, in say, you know, the world of death metal or whatever... Um, you know, we wanted to do something completely different than the thrash bands, the death metal bands, and uh, it was never meant for radio play. Um, you know, if we, you know, gotten college radio play, of course, you know, thankfully. Uh, but, you know, it, uh, the whole idea of the band putting it together was really, let's do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. So it was really difficult in the beginning for, um, you know, for us to be on tour with uh you know, uh, Sacred Reich or Pantera or uh, Morbid Angel or sort of someone. You know, um, people didn't know what to make of us. They, a lot of them, it was, it was, you know, hopefully something, something new to their ears. And, and uh, but to a lot of people, I think they thought we, you know, we were, we were. They didn't understand it. So when you don't understand something, it's very easy to dislike it. Um, but little by little, you know, we were able to, you know, to. Build build a, a nice solid following. I mean, we, we you know we arguably have the best following we've ever had at this point in our career. And um, 
you know, that's really important to me, but, uh, we've had a lot of, a lot of peaks and valleys. I mean, there's been a, a, a few occasions where I've actually been the only member of Crowbar. Um, you know, there was no band. I never had any, any intention of breaking it up. I just didn't have a band around me. Um, and reading, uh, reading Lemmy's book, uh, white line fever, he said the same thing. There was, you know, maybe once or once or at least once, but maybe twice where he was, he was, he didn't have anybody. It was just him. You know, and he, he had no intention of, of, of breaking up motorhead either. He just said, let me, uh, you know, let me, let me put together, um, a new band. I mean, like I always look at motorhead as, as kind of a, uh, not just an influence, but, but a way for me to, to look at my career with crowbar, which is, you know, we do something that, you know, we have, we have our peaks and valleys. We have a solid fan base that slowly continues to grow. Um, we influence a lot of bands. Most of those bands are bigger than we are, but, um, um, you know, the important thing that I always loved about a band like Motorhead was they just did whatever they wanted to do. They could, they did not care about what was going on around them trend wise, how they were supposed to, you know, what kind of clothes they were supposed to wear on stage, what kind of haircuts they were supposed to have, whatever it was. They were just themselves. They played, they made great records over and over and over again. They kicked ass on stage. They treated their fans with respect and, and, you know, and, and were nice, you know, nice to their fans. And that, that's kind of how I, I really based my, my entire career with Crowbar is it, that's that's what I want to follow. I want to follow in those footsteps. You know uh, that that that's that that's what what hits home with me is that type of attitude and that type of approach to the whole music business. Did you at any point when when the band members were were rotating in and out and you were there alone and and, and the music scene was going through the changes where you just said, you know, fuck this, I, this I'm out. I just I can't do this. Were, were there times where you just your back was against the wall and you just went okay. I'm crying uncle. I can't do this anymore. Or did you just, <laughs> you know, did you have that determination with you? Like, like Lemmy or were there times where you just thought, what am I doing here? And why am I bothering? I mean, to be honest, those thoughts have crossed my mind over the years. Um, you know, not recently, thank, thankfully, but, um, yeah, I mean, and, and the really, the really, you know, um, valleys, I call them, like I said, you know, the, the, the peaks and valleys, um, you know, when things were really bad, it was, you know, it, it was, I, mean, I was depressed, probably, to be honest, because, you know, I'm like, here I am, I'm, I'm giving 200%, I'm, I'm trying to do something completely original, and, uh, you know, it just, I, I would get those thoughts, but, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow them to, to, to stay in my head for, for very long at all, and I would say, you know what? Instead of saying "fuck that, I'm over," I'd say "fuck that, I'm, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to find a way to make this happen." And I, and I think I've, you know, I, I, I still have that attitude. That that's that's the way I feel. Is like, you know, uh, I I really try to try to really like my whole life, my, the way I live my life. I, I try to always see the glass half full. You know, I try to always have that positive mental attitude and realize how worse things can can be in life than within the way I have it. But, um, you know, when, if I, if we have a bad show or, you know, whatever, um, it might bum me out for a few minutes, but I try to find the positives in it and say, hey, guys, we got another show tomorrow, so let's kick ass tomorrow. I'll see. That, that's the attitude I like. Uh, let me ask you about about growing old as, as a heavy metal uh, rock star, because as we all get older, you know, listen, my back is killing me right now. Um, musically, when you, when you start off doing Crowbar, there's a lot of aggression and there's a lot of vocal... Do you sort of change the way you approach a new crowbar album or a new down album or a new whatever, knowing that maybe as you're getting older, it might be more difficult? Or do you still have the full power and it's still full throttle? How, how has it been in terms of physically and, and playing this kind of music, not being 20 years old anymore? Um, as far as like, the, you know, the writing and everything, or uh, just thinking about being old and you know, am I able to continue to do this? You know, do I get, do I feel like I'm going to have writer's block because I've written so many songs? I mean, those types of things don't, don't really, um, you know, don't bother me. I mean, of course, my age physically, um, it's kind of funny. It's one of those things, I guess, like if you're an athlete, because um, I do have, you know, your back's killing you. Well, my back's kind of killing me right now, too, and my knees are like when, when I played sports, you know, I mean, I only played them up through in the end of high school, but 
you know, if you had a little injury, you just you kind of just didn't think about it. You worried, you know, you you'd, you'd worry about it after the game was over, you know, after after the final whistle blew and the game was over. It's the same thing on stage. If I'm sick or I have a sore throat or, you know, I, I physically just just feel won't run down. I physically just don't feel good. Um, for some reason, when you hit the stage and the audience is in front of you, all of those things go out of the window, and all you're doing is having fun. All you're doing is is being focused on performing and putting on the best show you can for your fans. Right. So, so vocally you, you don't think of, of changing the, uh, the delivery of the song. You're, you're still going out there and singing like you've always sang the same approach. There's no, Oh, I've got to tune this down. I've got to, I've got to enunciate that differently. Um, actually with the vocals, I mean, if my voice is really ragged up, I don't, um, I kind of lay back a little bit, and, 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 and to be honest, I'm not really cheating the audience because when my voice feels good, I add a lot of extra stuff in. You know, I kind of ad lib and do things a little differently to make it make it kind of spontaneous, and I do some stuff that's higher in my you know singing register and and whatever. So normally, um, you know, uh, the the songs over over the course of time kind of take a life of their own. Sometimes when you've been playing playing them for so long, like. You know, a good a good uh, comparison or you know analogy or whatever you want to call it on that would kind of be like when Kiss decided to, to get back together for the reunion stuff in '96. You know, all of those songs, the old songs that they had played, they had, they had kind of had a different uh, arrangement. You know, uh, Paul would sing them different, Gene would sing them different. You know, they'd add different accents in with the you know playing with different guys. You know, having been that they were playing with different guys the whole the whole thing, and it's the same thing with us where you know certain things we've added on in, into into the majority of the songs um, that are a little different from the record. And I just, I think it keeps it spontaneous, but you know, if I am having a really rough night singing, I'm no, I'm usually, I don't want to jinx myself. 90, 90% of the time I'm able to pull it off where it at least sounds, you know, close to the record. And I mean, the thing that I'm, that's, you know, it, it, I'm fortunate as far as being, being a vocalist is, I don't have a great voice. People are not expecting me to be Jeff Tate. They're not expecting me. You know, I know Paul Stanley, you know, unfortunately he's been struggling a lot on, on this, this farewell tour. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not his fault. I mean, he's, he's reached a certain age and, and, and so many guys lose their voice and aren't able to, you know, to do what they were doing years ago. But for me, I mean, if my voice is raspy the way I'm talking right now, this is how I talk all the time. Um, you know, I, I feel, I feel, you know, much more uh, empathy, I guess. So, you know, I feel for the guys who people come to see him nail it 100% every night on vocals, whether it's a Rob Halford, you know, a Dio when he was still alive. People expect these guys because these are the guys everyone looks up to as a vocalist. People don't really look up to me as a vocalist. I'm, I'm looked up to more as a as a guitar player, a riff writer, whatever. So I'm, I'm fortunate in that sense that I, you know, if, if I'm having a rough night, I don't, I don't need to sweat it. Right. And and by the way, I don't ask that disres- uh, disrespectfully. The, the reason I, I ask is because I've always looked at a band like Metallica or Megadeth or, or, or you know, Phil Anselmo with Pantera and, when they're twenty, they're on stage and they're nailing it. And then I can just see them now. You know, you're 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 getting to fifty five, sixty, sixty five, and you go, "Wow, I got to go play Creeping Death." Holy shit! <laughs> yeah, like it, right, right. right? Like you, like it, it's got to be. You know, it, it requires such energy, and it's like, God, how do you do that? It, it, anyway, so I, I ask it out of, out of reference for you people because it's, for 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 musicians yeah, because yeah. it's like, man, you guys just. You deliver the goods, and here's stuff that you should only be playing when you're 25, and 40 years later, you're still nailing it out. So, so it's actually I ask that out of a lot of respect because it's it's, it's amazing how you you manage to do that uh, all 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 whether it's Dave Mustaine or, or James or you or it's it's unbelievable. And and I will finish on this uh, Kiss. We 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 do talk Kiss quite a bit. What was it about yes. that band that that attracted you. I know that, for example, if I post anything on Facebook, you're very much in the Ace Fraley camp, as am I. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> what, what was it about Ace? Because, you know, you look at all the musical, the, the musicologists, and they, they slam this, and he doesn't play that right. But that's not what it's about, right? It's about vibe and energy and turning on a fan. And he's got that, right? What is it about that guy? Absolutely. Um... And, you know, and I have, uh, first thing I'll say real quick is, 
I have, although, you know, I'm not a fan of Tommy Thayer, but they're not, I'm a big black and blue fan and I'm a very big fan of his work in black and blue. And I saw black and blue open for kiss on asylum or one of those, you know, one of, one of the, the, those tours around that time. And they were fantastic. Um, I think he's even said it and he's like, look, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think that's a guy that will never will be someone else, but on to Ace, um, he's the first guitar player that I heard, you know, when I, when I had Kiss Alive one, and I, I was just like, I've never heard anything like this. You know, I, I was just used to rock and roll radio, but of course I had heard, you know, I mean, I was only 10 years old, 11 years old. So my record collection consisted of only a few albums. So, um, you know, when I heard he's playing, I still think it, think to this day, he's one of those guitar players. Sure, there's, there's you know, tons of guys out there that play circles around him technically, you know. Uh, but that's not his thing. He's one of the few players when he can do the simplest little solo, like like the solo from I Was, uh, I was Made For Loving You or something. And you can just tell it's Ace. He's just got a certain style, a certain tone, a certain vibrato, and... As far as him, you know, to me, he's one. He's a, one of the ultimate rock stars. Um, he's just got that that charisma and that swagger about him. And he was, you know, he was always one of the rock and roll guys of Kiss. You know, like so much, so many people say with Peter as well. Well, you know, I mean, I mean, I love Peter, of course, but um, and of course, I mean, of course, I love Gene and Paul. But he's just. It struck me, hey, if I'm, you know, this guy is my first real influence, and he's the reason. That I picked up the guitar and uh, you know I just I, I love him. I mean, the last time I was there, I saw him about a little over a year ago in in Florida, um, and he was he he killed it. And we had the uh, I'm on the same label with Ace, so we got the the free meet and greet, which was fantastic. Got to you know take some pictures and and that was the second time I met him. But he will always and forever be my true one. One true guitar idol. Yeah, and, and and I'll say that too. And and it's funny with Kiss fans when you say like I, I always say on this farewell tour, I would like to see Ace back, and people automatically say, "Well, why do you hate Tommy?" And it's like, no, I don't hate Tommy. He's an what a terrific guy. He plays great, but there's just oh, he plays killer, right? You know, but it's just that fans always see it as it has to be you know black or white, this or that, and it's like, no, no, no. I like Tommy. Don't get me wrong. But there's just something about Ace, you know. The the ten year old Mitch Lafon has that Ace thing. Anyway, it's uh, a great pleasure uh, uh, talking to you today. And of course, uh, the new album. Oh, uh, you too, Mitch. Absolutely, absolutely. The new album is out. Uh, well, uh, by the time this airs, the album will be out now. And uh, folks, do check that out. And as we say in Montreal, Kirk, uh, merci beaucoup. An absolute pleasure. We we say that down here in New Orleans as well. So merci beaucoup. Oh, that's right, <laughs> because you're you're in New Orleans where it's all français and 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 yeah, with it's that, all uh, Le Bon Ton Roulet. You know that's the motto of our city. And uh, yeah, and without even uh, uh, noticing that I was going to talk to you today, I wore my Saints jacket today. So there you go. Oh, say yeah, I'm sure it's cold by you. Uh, and you know, um, a <clears throat> little bit, a little bit. The Saints, hey, I still, I love them. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> the Saints, yeah, no, no. Today, uh, today was I think thirty four degrees Fahrenheit, so it's like plus two. So it's it's not exactly hot, but it ain't. no, that's. I tell you what, uh, it, I mean, I, I know you, we're wrapping up here, but it was in. It was about thirty six night before last year Fahrenheit, so. Oh. For us down here, that's cool. You know, yeah, but. and for for us, uh, this this was like a, a warm streak. We 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 came off about three or four days of minus seventeen Celsius. So plus two, I'm in. I'm in. Anyhow. Hey, why not? Why not? <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Thank you, sir, and uh, plaisir. And I will have this Thanks up shortly. Me. And I look forward to the uh, crowbar tour with uh, Sepultura, which of course, uh, folks uh, here in Montreal will be here April first. Uh, at Lastral, which is a, I, I've told you that before, the great venue, really great venue. I'm, I'm, I played it all, you know, when I arrive, I'll know if I, I don't know the names. When I walk in, I, I recognize it. But, but yeah, look forward, look forward to seeing you. There. And, and thank you so much for the interview. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Anytime. Merci. Cheers. All right. Thank you. All right. Good. Let me turn that off. Thank this has been Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. For more exclusive content and interviews, subscribe on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, and many more. Follow Mitch on all the socials, especially Twitter, at Mitch LaFon, and on Instagram, at Mitch underscore LaFon.
Get your Mitch merch now at loudtracks.com slash Mitch.